Hi guys, it is another stormy, gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in the gray state of Texas here. And is it the first day of spring or the last day of winter 2020? But anyway, you have found your way into Collapse Chronicles. My name is Sam Mitchell. And this week, as you've probably figured out by now, we're doing a special series here at Collapse Chronicles called the Coronavirus Chronicles, where I am bringing onto the show about two dozen people from all walks of the, uh, of the collapsosphere to get their input on what the coronavirus might or might not mean for global industrial civilization. And it is a great pleasure to bring back onto this show Professor Rupert Reed. We're going to go all the way over there across the pond to England today and talk to Professor Rupert Reed, who is author of This Civilization is Finished. So, Rupert, come on and say hi to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this story. Hi, Sam. It's good to be with you and your listeners <laughs> once again. Okay, so uh, Rupert, well, you're the author of this. This civilization is finished. So, it is, in your opinion, coronavirus the trigger that we have all been waiting for for the beginning of the end of this global industrial civilization, and why or why not? Great question. I think it's unlikely to be. I think that what we're going to see here is a test. It's a, a test case sent to us. It's a, a warning given us by nature. Um, and it will very severely test us. It will especially test severely those of us whose governments are least well prepared for it. Uh, in which category, unfortunately, we have to place at the top of the list uh, the UK government and the US government, as far as we can tell, whose responses so far have been uniquely um, abysmal. Um, uh, the UK government being the worst of all um, in the terms of the, being the government, my own government, tragically, which has done the least to try to take seriously uh, this, uh, this epidemic, this pandemic, and has been the least uh, um, serious about taking a precautionary uh, response to it, the kind of response to it that I've been arguing for um, online, uh, in media and in publications, and also my colleagues uh, Nassim Taleb, and Joe Norman, and others have been doing uh, the same. So it's been a hit country like the UK and the US very hard. It's probably going to make, have all sorts of dramatic effects which we could discuss, but I am doubtful that it itself is going to be the trigger for the collapse of global industrial civilization. I think that we will find ways of, of being through this, but we will permanently change. It is an inflection point, and there are huge positive possibilities in that inflection point if we're ready to seize them. Okay, so we're going to get back to the government response in, in a couple of questions, but before we do, so where would you place the direct threat of coronavirus on the list of threats against civilization? Top, bottom, nowhere, or just somewhere in the middle of the, uh, of the bullet chamber? Yeah, so let me in reply to that, start off by reading uh, a passage from uh, my little book, The Civilization is Finished, okay. which, uh, which we talked about the first time that I was on, because I was writing it then, wasn't I? Um, so on page four of the book, um, I say, um, this civilization could collapse utterly and terminally as a result of climatic instability, leading, for instance, to catastrophic food shortages as a probable mechanism of collapse, or possibly sooner than that, through nuclear war, pandemic, or financial collapse leading to mass civil breakdown. Um, so, um, pandemic is uh, is clearly one of the ways in which we could go. Um, as we'll perhaps come back to later, I am doubtful that this pandemic uh, is the way that uh, this civilization, if it is going to collapse terminally, um, will will go. But there could be worse ones uh, coming along behind it. Again, coronavirus is a test. Um, or, of course, coronavirus might mutate, uh, but let's not get into that, uh, that possibility. Uh, I think that the coronavirus is um, still considerably behind uh, climate and ecology and also behind um, the other pandemics which are likely to come and behind uh, nuclear war. Um, so 
When you put that the other way around, then it's quite worrying. In other words, the system is under such threat, even from a, a virus which is not as bad as various other threats which we are likely to face, which we are already facing uh, right now um, in the world. Um, we are going to see countries like the UK and the US under horrendous strain uh, in the next few months, and we're going to see permanent changes resulting from that. If coronavirus can do that, then God help us when it comes to uh, multi-breadbasket failure, for example, perhaps later this uh, decade as a result of ecological degradation and so forth. Yeah, so I, I, you've probably already answered this question, but uh, I, I just want to make sure that we're getting you straight. So do you consider the direct threat, the direct health threats, you know, to humans, or do you consider the knock-on effects to the global economy, which one will ultimately prove to be the biggest threat uh, to civilization, health or economic? Yeah, really, yeah sure. Really interesting question. Um, the direct threat to human health is obviously uh, severe and tragic, but it won't collapse our civilization in itself. Um, the knock-on effects to the global economy um, are going to be very, very serious, but I think that that too uh, is ultimately going to be something that we're going to find ways of deal with, dealing with, including very clever ways, I hope, and ways that are actually going to improve things, and perhaps we'll come back to, to that point. But I'm actually going to kind of sidestep the question, and I'm going to say I don't think either threat is the biggest threat from coronavirus. I think that the, I think the biggest threat from coronavirus uh, is the threat that we may get a breakdown of our healthcare systems as a result of excessive pressure on them. That we may get um, a breakdown potentially of, uh, of some food supplies or of some industrial product supplies as a result of just-in-time systems becoming very vulnerable. And we may get um, threats to, uh, to social order and political order, um, which emerge from uh, either or both of those. Now, um, again, we have to think about this in terms of uh, opportunities as well as threats. Um, if it, what happens is we get some kind of social order breakdown, uh, then there are positive possibilities in that as well as negative possibilities. There are possibilities, for example, for the, uh, the kind of um, you know, appalling, um, um, un unspeakably appalling uh, government that you have in the United States to be replaced by something better. There are possibilities for people to set up stuff that actually works in their localities to replace the stuff which... Uh, Central and local government will be trying to do, which often doesn't work. So the word threat um, also doesn't fully cover it. I think that uh, actually what we're looking at is um, a threat and an opportunity uh, which has to do with um, potential um, social and political change of quite a radical order. Okay, well, we, uh, I, I want to get back to that, to that whole discussion in a minute, but I, I kind of want to divide this in into two parts, the, the, the center of our discussion here. And that is the reaction uh, yeah. to, to the threat. So first, let's look at, and, and I want you, since you're the only person I, I guess I'm going to be interviewing from England, I want you particularly to educate us on the, the I know you're not speaking well of the reaction, uh, do you think the reaction, do you think it's overblown? Do you think it's not strong enough? Or do you think it's about right, what's going on, at least in England? Yeah, so in terms of England, I think it's absolutely 100% clear that it's not strong enough. Uh, you look at the, the countries which have been pretty successful so far in terms of dealing with this outbreak. Uh, they are countries like uh, China, like South Korea, uh, like Singapore, um, Hong Kong, um, chiefly. Um, they're, they're country, Vietnam to some extent. Some of them are, are authoritarian countries, but not all. South Korea uh, is not. So it's not a, a straight question of political system. Uh, it's a question of seriousness in uh, approaching the issue. It's a question of whether you're prepared to actually prioritize taking care of the pandemic ahead of trying to keep economic business as usual on the road for a little bit longer. It's a question of which experts uh, you're listening to, if you're listening to any at all. Uh, in the States, uh, Trump doesn't really seem to be listening to any very much. But in our country, things uh, are even worse because I think 
the wrong experts are being listened to. So, for example, we've got not just psychologists who are playing a key role in um, influencing our government here in the UK. And they are telling the government, uh, look, you can't impose a lockdown, uh, or at least you can't impose it very long, because people just won't do it. Whereas what we're actually seeing, Sam, on the ground here in Britain is more and more people and communities getting ahead of the government uh, and imposing their own uh, physical uh, distancing uh, measures and taking their own measures towards trying to create some kind of safety. Because the government has so catastrophically let us uh, down here in not in imposing basically any restrictions at all. They've done virtually nothing uh, on the quarantine front. They've done virtually nothing in terms of reduce flights or movement. They've done no uh, lockdowns. There's virtually no testing uh, going on. The situation here is absolutely catastrophic. The precautionary principle is not being observed at all. Um, uh, and this is an aspect which particularly concerns me and has particularly uh, depressed me. Uh, the, kind of, the, the kind of common sense, which as I say, the people here are starting to show, is completely absent from the government response. Now, one more word about um, the terms that you use, overblown, not strong enough, or about right. Look, if you get a pandemic like this under control, really tough measures, as they have done in large parts of Asia, there's always a risk that it's going to look like your reaction was overblown. But the way my colleague Nassim Talib describes it, he said, look, the thing to do, you're faced with a serious enough threat, and that's what your work is all about, that threat. But the thing to do when you're faced with a serious enough threat is to, quote, overreact. Right? That, that is what you ought to do, because you've got to reduce your exposure to those threats. So uh, it's, it's a criminally negligent that our government, and in a somewhat similar way to a large extent, the American federal government, uh, are not reacting strongly. They are certainly not reacting strongly enough, and I think they're going to suffer for it. Well, we don't even need to go into question five. I think you have uh, g given, uh, g g given your opinion emphatically. Uh, there, there's no sense uh, even wading into that. So, guys, I, I want you to know what you're hearing in the background. I am sorry. We are having an absolute biblical deluge going on. Uh, uh, very appropriate. There is no drought in, in, in Texas right now, so all of that noise in the background, guys, uh, my garden is getting well watered. Uh, but there, Just but, question five, though, Sam. There is one thing I want to pick up. So the question five was basically, look, does coronavirus trump our civil rights? But I do want to make one point about this. Obviously, I'm arguing, um, as others in this country, such as uh, Rory Stewart, are arguing, I'm arguing that, yes, the government should have the power to curtail freedom of movement and impose quarantines and so on and so forth. But I also do think it's really important that we stand up for civil liberties, and in particular political liberties, at this time. Uh, I don't think the government should use, as our government seems to be wanting to use, uh, this crisis as an excuse simply for imposing a kind of state of emergency which would last uh, two years. This is the incredible ironic situation we have here, Sam, in the UK, and I think you've got some somewhat similar issues in the, in the US. On the one hand, the government is basically doing nothing. On the other hand, they want to use the crisis as an excuse for clamping down on our political uh, liberties and for stopping demonstrations and so on and so forth. Now that's a dangerous combination because people are going to need to find ways of rising up and protesting against this government, albeit you know, they're going to do it probably you know, not standing in huge crowds together, hopefully. Um, so so it's, quite a, it's quite a strange situation that we're in. We're in a time, it seems to me, where we have to stand up for our right to certainly freedom of speech and also within certain kinds of um, physically sensible constraints, freedom of assembly and so on and so forth. But we are also urging the government, for God's sake, please act now to protect us. Otherwise, we're going to be at risk, and especially our parents and our grandparents are going to be at terrible risk of dying in the horrible way that we're seeing in, in huge numbers right now in Italy. Yeah, well, I, 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 you, you're the first person who's pointed this out that uh, about how it's too little and too much. At the same, yeah. that you just can't win that, that poor government. But it's certainly gonna. Aren't you big in the Extinction Rebellion? I mean, you're not. There, there's not going to be any Extinction Rebellion uh, actions going on uh, for the foreseeable future. 
Well, yes and no. That we, we, have, we have suspended our um, rebellion on the streets that we were going to be doing in, in May, June. Uh, but what we are going to be doing is we're going to be doing really serious digital uh, activism. Uh, we're going to be doing um, uh, mutual aid for people who are uh, struggling with uh, coronavirus. And we may well, Sam, be doing some of that mutual aid in ways that itself um, constitutes nonviolent direct action. In other words, we're going to be looking to see where um, central government and other um, institutional structures in the UK are letting down the people and not protecting them and not looking after them. And we're going to be moving in to help those people, whether or not doing so is legal. Uh, we may be occupying buildings, for example, to, uh, to uh, look after people who are ill in those buildings if those people can't get looked after uh, through the National uh, Health Service. Uh, and, uh, and that's going to be a much more uh, sort of um, direct, if you will, form of, uh, of nonviolent direct action. Look out for that coming in the, in the next few months, if, as I suspect, tragically is the case, the health system here buckles and starts to break under the strain. Okay, so we need to switch gears uh, just in the, in the interest of, of time. So let's, let's move our focus now over to uh, what, what I think is the bigger story, at least what's unfolding right around me in, in Texas. And this is the reaction of the general public which mm -hmm. I am reading is an absolutely panic-stricken, uh, it, it, it just looks like a, 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 that coronavirus is the coyote who has run into the middle of the sheep herd, is what I'm seeing. Uh, it, 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 absolute panic. Uh, panic buying hoarding of food, uh, to hell with letting your neighbor get any food, I'm going to get it all. You can, uh, you can find your own food. And most worryingly, especially here in Texas, is, I mean, gun shops are doing the greatest business. They've, they know people are arming themselves with, with assault rifles. And is what we're seeing and, and, and in my opinion, uh, again, I, I, I think compared to what we're going to see, this is fairly mild. Yeah. Is this a snapshot I into the future of what we can expect as we see more and more coronaviruses coming down the pike and more and more people becoming clued in that we're in a new, that we're in a new planet? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the short answer is uh, yes, or at least uh, yes, it's a snapshot. It's not necessarily the snapshot. Um, so yeah, we're, we're seeing what we're seeing in the US, which I think is worse than what we're seeing here in the UK, although it's also worrying here in the UK. Uh, less worrying stuff going on um, in most of the continent of Europe. And maybe we can learn lessons here about the health of our different uh, uh, societies uh, from that. Of course, there's another angle to this, which is that there's a sense in which uh, it's actually encouraging to see people reacting seriously to the uh, scenario and thinking, oh my God, this could be really bad. In that way, it could be a kind of wake-up call. Um, and hopefully what people are going to learn from the wake-up call is, uh, number one, um, yeah, you need to take seriously that, that, that this civilization is not just going to go on as it is. Uh, it's either going to collapse or it's going to be radically changed. There is there is no continuation of business as usual. Uh, and number two, perhaps people will start to figure out what I think is not happening a lot in the U.S., but um, it is happening a bit more in some other parts of the world. Perhaps people will start to figure out that actually there is no genuine individualist solution to this. You know, that if you're trying to be... Um, uh, a survivalist by yourself or whatever, well, maybe you're going to be able to survive for a few months or a few years or possibly even a few a few decades, but it's not going to be the case that you're going to enable um, a society or a world which is going to be secure for your uh, children uh, if that's all that you do. We have to have intelligent, community-wide and, if possible, society-wide uh, responses. So that's what Say, I think what is a snapshot, but not necessarily the snapshot. I hope that part of what will come out of this is people will be more alive to the reality that this civilization, as it is, is not going to go on. Uh, 
but that their response to that, as well as including individual boarding and buying of weapons and so on and so forth, will include thinking about, okay, well, how might we be able to make things work in a radically different way, uh, and how might we work make how might we be able to get some kind of security uh, as a community, which we'll never really have if we're thinking of this in a purely uh, individualist way. So on this point, as on most of the other points we're talking about, I think there's a potential downside here, but also a potential upside. And, and you're, you're fairly optimistic on the chances of the upside, or is, is this just a hope, or is it a true, are you truly or optimistic that some sort of critical mass of awakening is going to come out of this? Well, I guess that comes to your, uh, the question number eight on your list, which, uh, shall I read it out? You say, well, let's, uh, you, well, number seven, first of all, uh, you do think there are going to be bigger threats than coronavirus coming down the pike that we are yeah, going so to have let's to take, respond let's take that to. On, and then we'll come to the, the question you just asked. Yeah, as you said earlier, I think it's clear that there are going to be bigger threats to coronavirus. So in that sense, it's quite worrying that this one is having such a disruptive effect given that bigger things are going to come and follow it. Probably bigger pandemics, certainly bigger uh, challenges, maybe slower to play out um, from ecology and, uh, and uh, climate, uh, maybe um, bigger effects from um, economic uh, collapses, which will probably be climatically mediated. And that's not even mentioning war, which is always uh, an uncertain uh, possibility. So yeah, I think there are larger threats uh, coming down uh, the pike. Um, the, the question is, you know, are we going to learn from uh, coronavirus um, in such ways that we'll be better equipped to face those threats, or that we'll be um, worse equipped? And so you ask me, look, is it just a is it just a hope uh, that I have? No, I think it's a bit more than a, than a hope. Um, we are already seeing in the UK uh, a huge upsurging of mutual aid groups, people helping their neighbours, offering to help those in self-isolation, uh, etc. And as I said earlier, we're seeing the people here move increasingly ahead of the government, which is moving desperately uh, slowly and being incredibly lackadaisical and has this absurd idea that you may have heard about that we can achieve uh, herd immunity uh, to the coronavirus by way of allowing most people to get infected with it, which is just about the... the <laughs> most dangerous idea that you've ever, you've ever heard. Um, so I take some hope from the, from the reaction of the people in this country to the coronavirus. Um, I think that the, what I've heard of the reaction so far in the United States doesn't give me quite as much hope. Maybe that tells us something about the United States. Um, but again, I think that countries are going to be learning from each other here. You know, people will be looking to see what worked and what didn't. And I think that people will be taking positive lessons from what they did in Wuhan positive lessons from what they did in South Korea, and maybe they'll also be taking positive lessons from the kind of mutual aid stuff that is already starting, as I say, uh, here in the UK. And that is a, a basis for hope. It's not just a, a, a hope without any basis. Okay, and so let's wrap up with, we've been, we've been talking about humans for 23 minutes. Let's talk about every other species of Earthing we share this planet with. Yeah. How are they viewing this? Is this a, a crisis or an opportunity to the dolphins who are returning to the canals of Venice for the first time in decades because there's not all these boats to smack them in the head when they get there? Yeah. Talk about yeah. that a minute. The, is there any lemonade being uh, coming from all these lemons if you're an, a, another earthling other than a human? Well, absolutely. The, the answer has to be yes, doesn't it? It's like uh, the situation around Chernobyl. Um, so Chernobyl, obviously, everyone knows, uh, nuclear reactor gone wrong. Uh, the area around Chernobyl is quite contaminated, and so unfortunately, the uh, the animals uh, living there um, do have a higher rate uh, than ordinary wild animals of uh, of negative uh, mutations. Um, but even despite that, um, they get on much better there than they get on in most of the rest of uh, of uh, of um, that part of uh, Eastern Europe. Or any part of Europe. Thank you um, for pointing yeah. I've been pointing that out for years. I call Chernobyl yeah. the single most optimistic spot of the all planet Earth right now is Chernobyl. I have been saying that. I'm so glad you brought that up, brother. So, yeah. do, do, do you see that effect uh, already? I mean, just this quick already. Uh, yeah, well, it's taking... extraordinary. Isn't it? We are already seeing some positive effects like that. There's also the massive reduction uh, in air pollution. There's a very significant reduction in uh, climate-deadly greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Now, 
if the pandemic uh, takes off fully in the way that it's threatened to do in countries like the UK and US, never mind some of the parts of the global south where obviously healthcare systems are much more fragile still, um, then we're going to lose a hell of a lot of human lives uh, and uh, those lives lost will probably outweigh the lives saved from um, the emissions reductions and the pollution reductions. But those reductions are real and they're having an effect right now and they're benefiting human beings and they're benefiting obviously uh, non-human earthlings uh, as well. So yeah, um, it's quite clear that there are that there are a number of dimensions in which coronavirus is not only a, um, a bad thing but also potentially a good thing. A number of dimensions in which it's not only a threat but also an opportunity. So as I've been saying throughout our little conversation here, Sam, I think what we have to do is we have to be really serious about trying to maximize the, the good and minimize the bad. We have to be ready to say when people try to return our civilization to normal um, as this pandemic dies down, which it probably will in, say, a year's time or something, we have to be ready to say very loud and clear, no, we are not prepared to go back to business as usual, which is a path towards mass death and, and total collapse of everything and everybody. We want to try to make sure that in the future we keep those pollution reductions, we keep those greenhouse gas emission reductions, we keep improving things for uh, not human animals uh, on our planet. And you know, if we can do that kind of thing, then maybe we'll look back on the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis and be able to say to ourselves, yeah, sure, it was the worst of times, but well, also in a certain sense, it was the best of times or it makes possible uh, the best of times relative to what we've been uh, living uh, over the past generation. Okay, I think that is a fine way to wrap up this conversation. So, uh, guys, if you enjoyed what Rupert had to share with us, please spend a few seconds to uh, vote up this video. And by all means, when you're over here, please subscribe to Collapse Chronicles and look forward to about probably about three more days of uh, the coronavirus chronicles but rupert reed i know you were slammed this week we really appreciate you taking uh, some time out of your busy schedule to come talk to us most importantly keep up the good fight and you too sam and let's both keep well bye guys